Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. So glad you are here with us this morning on this Palm Sunday. If you're joining us online this morning, we also are glad you are joining us. If you're visiting with us today for the first time, very special welcome to you. I would invite you, if you are a visitor, to fill out a connection card. You'll find that in the bulletin or in the seat rack in front of you. If you would, and drop that in the offering box on the back table there when you leave. We want to get to know you better. We are here all together uh, to worship the Lord this morning. So we invite you and you online who are watching to join us as we lift up songs of praise to our Savior, as we offer up prayers to him, as we spend time around the communion table. Uh, we practice open communion here, and uh, that will be coming up shortly. Uh, but it's in remembrance of Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. And with that, let's go to God in prayer. Would you bow with me? Our Father, this is your day. Every day is your day. It is especially a blessing when we can come and come together and worship in your name with brothers and sisters in Christ. And we know your name's being lifted up around the world. So we're grateful to be a part of the voices that are lifted up. Father, as we've come this morning, we remember that Jesus came into Jerusalem to shouts and cheers and joy and rejoicing. Lord, we thank you that Jesus has come into our lives and has made a difference for eternity. Lord, we offer praise to you this morning. May you find it pleasing. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Please stand and sing as we worship and praise our Lord.
praise him. So fun to sing to him. Sunday. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it's been um, pretty quick coming upon me. <laughs> it's the end of March, and, it, and we're already here almost to Easter. And so I just wanted you to really, as we sing the next several songs, focus on that and focus on how great it is that our Lord left heaven and came here to earth and was willing to die, live a perfect life first, and then die on our behalf. And so this week, let's focus on just, I mean, think back, the triumphal entry and how Jesus was coming to Jerusalem knowing that he would be crucified, knowing that he had to die for us, but yet the people welcomed him and showered him with palm branches. And in John 12, 12 to 13, it says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel.
prayer time this morning. Uh, Ron Murphy shares a prayer of thanks. Thanks for many prayers. Thanks for food. Thanks for physical manpower. Uh, on behalf of Ron and Marion and Nancy, let's continue to keep them in prayer. Marion comes home tomorrow, I believe, is the latest. Um, so be praying for that. Also, a prayer of praise for Debbie Newton, the prayer request went out during the week, uh, had a clot that resolved, and uh, that's a praise to God. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we rejoice today in your holy presence. We join our hearts and our voices with your people around the world as the name of Jesus is lifted high. His is the name above every other name. We praise you over and over again for the sacrifice Jesus made to pay for our sins, to restore the relationship that was broken when we sinned against you. And we praise you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who reveals your word and your truth 
so that we can know you, so that we can please you. Lord God, may you receive all glory, honor, and praise. And may the world see Christ Jesus through our words and actions. Father, we want to thank you for your involvement in our lives, for caring about us the way you do, for bringing healing, for bringing answers to prayer, for bringing help and encouragement of all types whenever it is needed. We do lift up Marion and Ron, and we pray that you would continue to hold them close uh, at this time. Thank you for this church body that has come alongside them and helped to show Jesus to them. Lord, we thank you for Debbie Newton's good report. We thank you that you work in ways that man cannot answer. Uh, your ways are beyond understanding. We know that you are faithful, and we're grateful for that. So we thank you for answering that prayer for Debbie, and we ask that she would be strengthened at this time. Father, we pray for Meadowbrook. We pray that you would be the one we set our sights on, that your word would be what we listen to, what we follow, what we teach. Father, wherever the good news of Jesus is shared today, we pray that lives would be changed. We pray that people everywhere would respond to the Lord's invitation and surrender their lives to him. Help us, Father, each one of us, to draw closer to you each day, to surrender any attitudes or actions or thoughts that keep us from obeying your will. Lord, forgive our sins, make us clean. Jesus, you are the King of kings, and we will worship and praise your name forever. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you've already heard, you already knew, today is Palm Sunday. It's the day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He came in riding the colt of a donkey. People were laying palms on the road in his path, and they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's from Matthew 21, verse 9. Jesus had a busy week ahead of him. On Monday, on his way to the temple, he cursed a fig tree. And while in the temple, he drove out the money changers. On Tuesday, the fig tree he cursed the day before was withered and dead. He had many confrontations with the Jewish leaders. He told about the widow's might. He told several parables. Uh, some of them were about the, the, the vineyard, the ten virgins, and the talents. And he told about his coming crucifixion. We don't have any biblical record of what went on on Wednesday, but on Thursday we have the preparation for the Passover, the Last Supper in the upper room, the washing of the disciples' feet, the institution of the Lord's Supper, and his last speech to his disciples. Then comes Friday the Garden of Gethsemane, the betrayal by Judas, the arrest, the trials, the crucifixion, his death and burial in a tomb. Remember, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get back to Palm Sunday. We, yeah. um, on Palm Sunday, they didn't see him coming, not him. They saw hope rekindled, an end to their injustice, and an easier path to follow. They waved their palm offerings and laid down their finest clothes, but they saw only a temporary king, not a suffering servant. On Palm Sunday, they sang Alleluia from the depths of their hearts and would have crowned him if they could have. 
but they didn't understand. They didn't see Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, soon and coming King. They misunderstood his kingdom was not of this world. On Palm Sunday, Jesus knew. Astride the back of a donkey, he knew why he had come. The Son of God humbles, humbled himself. He set aside royalty, and he exchanged heaven's robes for a towel and a basin of water. He received their praise that day, but he saw their hearts, young and old alike, and he wept for them, and then he died for them. Each week as we gather around this table, we remember that Jesus died for us. We remember that he sacrificed himself for us. And we remember that through his sacrifice, we have the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. God, it's hard to believe that so many things that we read about, that we know about, the various stories, the various things that went on in your life, uh, so many of them happened in just that last week, and it's so full of meaning, meaning for the future, meaning for what we have to look forward to because of your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you for being our, our sacrifice. Thank you for giving up your life, even though you were perfect, for giving up your life, even though we're the ones that deserve to, for giving up your life because that's what your Father declared. And we thank you for going through that process. We thank you that because of your sin, because of your sacrifice for our sin, that we can have the hope of eternal life. We look forward to this coming week, knowing that uh, we can celebrate not only your crucifixion on Good Friday, but your resurrection on Sunday morning. We look forward to that, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, everyone. Who doesn't love a good parade, right? The sights and the sounds, there's, there's pageantry, there's camaraderie in a parade, there's just a general air of excitement that surrounds a parade. Uh, for me personally, I have one lingering memory that stays with me about a parade. Now, it's a story I have told before. Um, I realized I think this weekend actually marks two years of my family being here, so quick side note, the longer I'm here, the better chances that you are going to hear a story repeated. Uh, and also thank you to everybody who has stuck in with us over the last two years. You see, but I, I normally wouldn't just retell a story on purpose. Uh, the thing is, the first time I told this story, I, I, I talked about it in one of those Monday moment emails I sent out. And I see all the metrics from those Monday Moment emails, so I know that only about 50% of you actually open those emails every single week. And normally I'd be mad, and I'd tell you guys, come on, open your emails, read what it is that I write to you. But this week it works in my favor, because at least half of you have not heard this story before. So my best parade memory uh, comes back in 2018, uh, February of 2018, actually. Uh, I had just witnessed my hometown football team uh, lift the Vince Lombardi trophy. Uh, now for you Lions fans, you may not be aware of what this is. It's a special trophy. If your team wins a Super Bowl, it's really pretty. It's got like a silver football on the top. It's gorgeous. Maybe one day you'll get the experience. Um, <laughs> one day maybe you'll get to witness your favorite player or your, a man wearing your team's colors lift that trophy. But for me, it was February of 2018, and the Philadelphia Eagles had just won the Super Bowl, a uh, great moment in my life. Uh, we got to watch that evening as one of maybe the most unlikely Super Bowl MVPs uh, ever was crowned in Nick Foles. Uh, he was this backup quarterback, a journeyman quarterback, uh, also a very faithful Christian man, but, but he stepped into the spotlight because the star quarterback got injured, and he made the most of the opportunity that was given to him. Uh, this is the year, I don't know if this means as much to you guys as it does to me, but if I say the words Philly special, do you guys know what that is? Okay, this is this play, right? Nick Foles takes the ball, he, he sends the ball this way, he bootlegs around to the corner of the end zone, and the quarterback catches a touchdown pass, right? It's, it's a thing of legends, it's the, things, the, the type of thing that gets a statue made of you that, that's put out in front of the stadium, and you are immortalized. Now, the other part of winning a championship is it means that there is going to be a parade, right? Your whole city is going to, to shut down for that day. Uh, a lot of times schools will even close. Uh, police officers, they look the other way when it comes to the open container laws of your city. And the whole team marches down the main drag of town. There's music blaring, there's confetti falling. And for me, I had waited over 30 years, hoping that one day I would get to attend a championship parade for my Philadelphia Eagles. So lo and behold, now they finally, they win the big game, but instead of living in Pennsylvania and going and celebrating with my team on Market Street, I lived in Florida, right? So geographically, I was too far away. All I could do was watch the parade on the internet, sitting by myself in a room wearing my green, Kelly Green Eagles jersey. You see, but then I remembered something. I remember there's a second parade that happens when your team wins a Super Bowl. And this parade, it isn't for the whole team, mind you. This parade is just for the game's most valuable player. I had forgotten that if you are the Super Bowl MVP, you get whisked away to the happiest place on earth. All right, maybe you remember these clips from when you were younger. I know for me, my, my hero as a kid was Joe Montana. Right? And after Joe Montana would win a Super Bowl, the announcer would come over and they'd say, Joe, you just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? Right? And Joe Money would coolly answer, He'd say, I'm going to Disney World. And sure enough, a day or two later, Joe would be out there on Main Street, USA, on top of a float, waving to his adoring fans. So I may not have been able to be involved in, in the literally near riot of a parade that happened in Philly because of my geography, but I was in the perfect place to go and see the Super Bowl MVP live and in person, on top of a float, rubbing elbows with Mickey the Mouse. So I did what any responsible adult would do. I called out of work sick. I grabbed Sydney and Peyton, and we made our way to the Magic Kingdom. It was awesome. There was Eagles jerseys everywhere. Um, there, there were a few unfortunate tourists that day that were wearing Patriots gear. Uh, they were literally booed out of the park because, yes, Eagles fans are some of the worst people in the entire world. 
But we found a good spot to watch the parade from, excited to catch a glimpse of this man who quite literally, many would say, had just performed a miracle by, by bringing a Super Bowl championship to Philadelphia. Right, there was chance of MVP, MVP on Main Street. My, my favorite was E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles rang through the air. It was wonderful. It was the best parade I have ever been to. You see, a parade has always been a way to celebrate victory. And we have parades like the Macy's Day Parade, or we have maybe have parades like, again, in Philadelphia, you have the Mummers Parade. But usually, the point of a parade is to celebrate and to honor a brave, a victorious, a heroic man or woman. The imagery that probably comes to most of our heads when we think of a parade are those like iconic ticker tape uh, parades in New York City. Right, we have the streamers, the confetti falling from the, 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 the tall skyscrapers, and these parades are held for, for presidents, they're held for Olympic champions, for astronauts, returning war heroes, they've even been held for royalty and for popes. Now, as I looked up the history of the ticker tape parade, we certainly don't have as many of them as we used to, but again, the, the imagery of it is iconic. Where you see these champions, these heroes, these people that we want to get close enough to, to be able to say, I was there when. And in the ancient world, it was very similar, right? Returning victorious heroes, when they came home, they would be recognized for whatever their perceived greatness was. People would want to come, they'd want to honor them, they'd want to be close to the hero, be close to the victory. In the context of the Roman world, they called these triumph parades, where a general who was being honored, they, they would place a crown made of leaves on his head. He'd, he'd adorn a purple toga that would have gold embroidery on it, like purple, again, being this, this kingly or this divine color. Their goal being to, to prop up this victorious general, to make him look almost king-like, almost divine, and then parade him in front of the adoring masses. There are some instances in these uh, triumph parades where they would even paint the general's face red because they wanted him to look as similar as he could to their god, Jupiter. And the general would come and he'd be pulled back into town in a chariot, being pulled by four white horses of war. Behind him would march his army. With his army would be any slaves that they had captured on their mission. All the treasure that they would have plundered on their mission, that would have been there too. These triumph parades must have been quite a scene. I can picture people chanting, R-O-M-E, Rome, Rome, Rome. I mean, I don't... No, if that's exactly what it would have sounded like, but that's what I picture in my head. Uh, the point being is there were parades then, and, and, and parades then were causes for celebration, just like they were today. Parades were also causes for celebration, where we're going to be reading today in the 12th chapter of John. The parade we're going to read about today, though, it had no ticker tape streamers falling from the sky. There were no cartoon mice endorsing a Super Bowl champion. There were no spoils of war to be paraded. Comparatively, it was a very simple parade. It was a parade of one man dressed in modest attire, seated atop a modest donkey. But in this moment, garnering more attention and more excitement than even would be generated by a Super Bowl MVP or a conquering general returning home from the front lines. You know, for a lot of us, the remembrance of this simple parade into Jerusalem is what begins this journey of what's called Holy Week, this march that begins here on Palm Sunday and then leads us into Good Friday and Easter. It's the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem ahead of the Passover. This is what kicks off this, this whole week into motion. The joy that is experienced in this moment during the simple parade into the city, it should stick with us. It should serve as a very stark reminder of the contrast and the darkness that we are going to witness on Friday. But now where we are in our story, like you just heard, it's five days prior to the celebration of the Passover. The Passover being this remembrance of what God had done for his people in Egypt when they were slaves. How, how the people in e uh, the, the Jews, I should say, in Egypt, they marked their doorposts with the blood of a sacrificial animal. And because of this marking, this angel of death would pass over their homes on that fateful night 
when the firstborn child of every Egyptian home lost their life. This was this, this final act in this, this war, let's call it, that would convince Pharaoh to finally let God's people go. And now, to celebrate that Passover, Jesus is doing what every good Jewish man should have been doing. He's going to Jerusalem so he can celebrate appropriately. You see, at at the time of Passover, the population of Jerusalem, it would swell to unbelievable numbers. There's, There's not many very good records to tell us how many people would be in the city at this time. Uh, One Roman historian that lived in the first century, Josephus, uh, he estimated, he says that he witnessed 2.7 million people being in Jerusalem for a Passover around this time. Now, I don't know how realistic that number is. It's very hard to believe. Uh, Cities back then were much smaller than our cities today. But the point is, the mass of humanity that would have been in and around Jerusalem at this time would have been staggering. It would have been impressive. This is what John records for us. This is, again, chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. It says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. A large crowd has learned that Jesus is coming, and and obviously from their response, you can tell they are really, really excited. Why are they so excited? If we actually jump ahead a few verses, John is going to be nice enough to tell us to fill in the blank about why the people in the city on this day are literally buzzing that this Jesus guy is coming into their town. On uh, verses 17 and 18, this is what it says. It says, The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was they heard he had done this sign. In the chapter previous uh, in John's Gospel, uh, we're going to be getting back to hearing about uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. We kind of jumped ahead in our order here for the observance of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter. But the raising of someone from the dead is a miracle that cannot be ignored. And when they witnessed this, the people who were already following Jesus, when they saw this miracle, it says that they literally, they ran ahead... And they told the pilgrims who had gathered in Jerusalem what they had witnessed with their own eyes. They tell a story of of seeing a man who was dead, whose body was prepared for burial, who was laid in the ground, and who rose to life at the command of Jesus' voice. Right? This is something they had seen with their own eyes. They they also witnessed the reaction of the man's family. They saw Jesus' emotion in this moment as well. And what they had witnessed, it convinced them. It convinced them enough that they threw caution to the wind and they ran ahead of Jesus and they spread the news of what they had seen happen. And as the people here, they recognize this miracle as it being a sign. So joyfully, they go out to meet Jesus as he enters the city. And what they actually do, again, is culturally maybe unrecognizable to us as they gather these palm branches and and they greet him with the waving of these palms. It's not something that we do typically in our worship of God. Good thing, because when it's 18 degrees out, I don't know where we would find any palm fronds right now. But this is something that that the Jewish people, they would do at other times as well during uh, one of their other festivals, uh, the Festival of the Tabernacles. Back in in the book of Leviticus, when it tells us uh, how the people should worship God during this festival, one of the ways that they are told to worship is by waving bundles of palm fronds. This is something the people would have done in worship to God. Something they would do to, to God as their victorious king. This was not a common way that they would just greet any old teacher of the law. Again, the words that they cried out as Jesus approached this day, they they weren't words that they would use to just greet any old teacher that was coming into town for the holiday, for the festival. They shouted, Hosanna. Hosanna, a shout of praise in Hebrew literally means save now. The people are shouting at Jesus, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. 
Remember in chapter 6 where we were reading last week, Jesus miraculously feeds the people. And he senses that after that miracle that the people are ready to come and they're ready to take him and make him their king. And what did he do in that instance? He, he slipped away under the cover of night, not wanting any part of the plans that the people were making, but now it's different. Now the people are waving palms at him like he is a king, like he is God. People are shouting at him for salvation from all of their plights, like he is a conquering hero and he does not sneak away. He does not silence them. Because now the time is right. The final chapter of this story is now beginning to play out right before us. In this instance, he accepts their praise. John tells us another very important detail about this impromptu one-man parade in verses 14 and 15. It says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Other gospel authors feel it's important to tell us how Jesus acquired this donkey or this colt, uh, but John doesn't, right? Again, John just likes being a little bit different. We all have one of those friends that when everybody's going left, he's going to go right. Uh, John just kind of feels, he, he just wants you to understand that it did happen. He wants you to understand the why that it happened, that that is what is important. Right, Jesus did not acquire this donkey to ride into town because his legs were just tired. Jesus did a good amount of walking. i got to imagine Jesus was a pretty fit guy. I believe he could have walked those last few hundred feet into town under his own power if he desired to do so, but he doesn't. He stops, and it says he mounts a humble donkey. Again, not a war horse. There's no chariot in sight in this moment. Jesus rode this donkey's colt to fulfill prophecy that is told to us in Zechariah, back again in the Old Testament, Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The scene the waving palms, the shouts of Hosanna, the rapidly spreading story of a man who is coming who had just raised the dead. And then the sight of this, this one-man parade, just one man on top of a colt, the foal of a donkey, as had been promised to them so long ago. You would like to think that if you were paying attention that you would not have been able to ignore what was happening right in front of you. You would hope that you wouldn't be able to. But in verse 16, it says this. It says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. In the, in the moment, his own disciples didn't understand. Right? It says that only after he was resurrected and he ascended to heaven did they actually put these pieces together together which sure makes me feel better sometimes about the things that I struggle with and the things that I do not understand. Right? Even though in this moment his own disciples may not have understood, there was someone or a group of people who seemed to have understood a little bit more about what was happening. It was the people who had already aligned themselves as being the enemies of this coming king. In verse 19 it says, The Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And this might sound odd, but it's this line from the Pharisees that is my favorite part of this scripture. It's my favorite line in this story. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And it's my favorite because you can almost like sense the, the dejection and the panic in their voices as you read that. You see, they see what is happening. And they understand, or at least they think that they understand, because they see that something different is happening, that this man is different than all of the troublemakers who had come before him. You remember, at this time, they've already labeled Jesus as a wanted man, as somebody with a target on their back, and, and then they look up and they see that this man whom they have been searching for is parading down the street in public right in front of them. As they realize that this grip that they've had, this power that they've wielded over the people, they see it loosening. And it would have been their desire to snatch him up right there, to take care of their heretic problem that they had right there, but they cannot. 
and they cannot do it because the whole world was going after this king who was sitting on the back of a donkey. The whole world was buzzing about this man who had fed 5,000 people, this man who raised the dead, this man who taught with authority. Right? No one was waving palm branches at the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are left helpless, just looking on, because as they say, the whole world had gone after Jesus, and their desperation is evident. Uh, let's backtrack a few verses here. Let's go look at uh, verses 9 through 11. It says, When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The Pharisees, they were not interested in searching for truth. What they were is they were desperate to keep something exactly like this parade of this victorious, humble king from happening. And in order to do that, they were prepared to murder. They were so desperate, so panicked, as they, they clutched their pearls. Right? They would do anything in their power to keep the status quo. So even now in this moment, if there is a man who people say has risen from the dead miraculously, what they figure the best thing that they can do is to put that man right back into the ground. Because that would shut the people up. These religious leaders at this point, they are off the rails. They are revealing themselves for who they are, as Jesus would say, who their father truly is. And in this moment, the whole world, or at least their little part of the world, was going after Jesus. Why? The answer, the reason the whole world was going after Jesus is because those who had witnessed his greatness... Those who had witnessed his glory firsthand, they refused to shut up about it. Verse 17, it says, The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. These people had to know that the men that were in power, that they would hate them for doing this. Right? They have to know that the Pharisees had already labeled Jesus as someone who had a target on his back. Maybe they had also already started to hear grumblings that the Pharisees now even wanted Lazarus dead as well. But still, the followers of Jesus, they would not shut up. They kept going and telling everyone about the miracles. They kept going and telling everyone about the teaching and about the wisdom. And eventually, the whole world, at that moment, was all in a froth willing to ignore the religious leaders and follow their instincts about this man. Not just another false prophet who was here to gain notori notoriety or power. And in spite of the wishes of the powerful and of the elite, they still gather on the street and they shout Hosanna. They wave their palm branches loudly and proudly. And the question is, wouldn't you like to see our whole world, or at least even our little city here, going after Jesus? Can you imagine what it would be like if next Sunday, Easter morning, you get up and you're loading your family in the car to come to church, right? You've probably already had four meltdowns about the dress is uncomfortable, my socks don't fit right, I can't find the hair dryer, whatever it might be. You can tell I live in a house with girls. And as you're loading everyone into the car, you look around and you, you realize, instead of being the only one on your block who's out and about this early on a Sunday morning, right, when all of your neighbors are usually tucked cozily still into their beds, maybe dreaming about what breakfast they're going to have, you look around and you notice that all the driveways on your street are empty. And you load your family up, and as you're, you're driving down the road, you start to realize the roads are really, really packed for a Sunday morning. It's odd. Usually you have them to yourself on the way to church, don't you? And since this is my fantasy, I'm going to pretend in this story that it's not 20 degrees out on Easter. I'm going to pretend that it's a beautiful, warm morning, so maybe you have the windows down in your car. 
and you start to hear some familiar sounds coming in through your windows. You start to realize that Caleb is having a ratings bonanza because all the other cars on the road are all listening to the same radio station that you are. You stop at a red light and, and, and you look around and you see that there's other people sitting in their cars worshiping God. As you continue to drive, you notice that it isn't the parking lots of the uh, bougie brunch spots that all the people are turning into. As you drive, you, you notice that after church after church that you pass, people are, 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 are pouring into, that their parking lots are full, that people are willing to park on the side streets and walk to get to church, to have the opportunity to worship their risen Savior. You finally, you make it here to Meadowbrook and you open up the doors and what you see is that there are no seats left for you. You look around and you see old and young and black and white all gathered together because our whole city is going after Jesus the same way that they did on that first Palm Sunday. What would it take to see that happen? Same as it did here. It would take a group of followers that were so overwhelmed with what they had seen that they refused to keep quiet. And that in their excitement that they would be going out and making a way for the gospel of Jesus Christ to do its thing. That is what it will take. And before everyone in this room sells themselves short, I'm going to cut you off right at the pass. Yes, these people that went ahead of Jesus, they had witnessed with their own eyes an extraordinary miracle. They had a story to tell everyone about. They had seen the resurrection of the dead. I think we can all agree that this is a story that would get people to stop and would get them to listen to you. And I do hope that you will get to the point in the relationships that you have with the people around you where you will have the emotional currency built up in your relationships that you begin to be able to study the Bible with them and you can read the story of Lazarus with them. But I think step one is being confident enough to introduce them to the miracle that is standing right in front of them. Are you confident enough to be able to share with someone the hope that you have in Jesus Christ personally? The rest that you have found in him, the transformation that the Holy Spirit has worked inside of you. Right, the question is, are you willing to be the first wave? Are you willing to be the front line? Are you willing to be a walking billboard for the kingdom of God? And if not, if you're hoping that someone else will be, if you hope that someone else will be brave because you refuse to be, you also need to stop being surprised that the world that you live in has stopped chasing after Jesus. Pray with me. Father, Father, we pray this morning that we will not just be people who, who shout Hosanna in worship this morning. And then forget about the great call and the great commission that you have given us on Monday through Friday. Father, you have done amazing works in so many of the lives. Dare I say all of the lives in this room, everyone who has turned their life over to you, Father, has a story to tell, has a testimony to share. And sometimes, God, as we get far, farther and farther away from those miracles in our own life, the, the, the stories, they begin to dim the excitement in our face, the joy in our hearts, it just it, it gets so far away, Father, that we forget to go out and to share that hope and those stories and our testimonies. Father, I pray that we would share the miracles, share the signs, share the wonders, share the joy, share the rest, share the peace. Father, because if we do it, it will look so different than what we see happening around us in the world. God, give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the power. Remind us that, that we don't have to be superheroes, that Jesus already did the heavy lifting, that all we need to do is to be able to effectively share the story, share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trust that it is a story that is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. Trust that it still has the power to change hearts and win souls. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
please stand if you would like to. You can sit if you'd like to, but just let's focus on Jesus as we sing the song.
so much for being here and worshiping with us today. As always, I am grateful that you are my church family. I want to remind you this week, a little change to hopefully your normal weekly calendar. We are going to be gathering here this Friday in observance of Good Friday at 7 p.m. So I do uh, hope that you, your families, will come and join us for that time of remembrance. I also want to remind you on Sunday, maybe your calendar needs to change a little bit as well, as we will be having a uh, breakfast, a church family breakfast here on Sunday before service. I want to remind you there are sign-up sheets in the foyer, two sheets, one to sign up if you want to bring food, one to sign up if you want to come. That means if you're bringing food and you're going to come, your name should be where? Both sheets. You guys are smart. I knew you could figure it out. I also remind you the Michigan Christian Convention is coming up. I'd love to see some of your smiling faces there. It will not cost you anything other than the travel to Great Lakes Christian College, which isn't that far away. So I hope some of you will take advantage of that in the coming weeks and get registered. Uh, Church, I pray that this week is going to be full of joy and remembrance for you. Um, Brenda, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you, were, you had a plan for us, that you had a plan to draw us to you. We're thankful for your son, Jesus. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit that lives in us and draws us to you, Lord. And we're just thankful for your plan and your provision for us, Lord. Be with those this week as we go out. Help us to share this good news. Help people to just learn more about you and help us to be your hands and feet as we go, Lord. Watch over us as we go home today and just give us safety. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
He is the King of all. Crowned with many crowns. Many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. Crown him the King to whom is given the wondrous name. Yeah.